So, hello everybody. Sorry for the delay. We had a slight mishap with our presentation. Um, thank you for joining us today. We would like to show you how we at SAP are using OpenStack at home in our shop to service our customers. My name is Martin. I'm here with Andrew and Michael. We are all engineers working on our um, OpenStack cloud. To give you a little background, SAP is a software company. So um, we are, like all other software companies, currently in transition. We are moving from shipping our product on a CD to our customer um, to a deployment model where we run the application and the customer is just a, a user um, using our applications in our cloud. And this is where our part, the converged cloud, actually um, comes into play. So we are what we would call an internal cloud. So you can't buy infrastructure services from SAP, but our payload is not development only or um, in-house applications only, but it's a massively external facing business from SAP. So for us, um, uptime is a very important factor. Um, we are currently um, planning to be in 15 regions worldwide. Nine of those are already up and running and we are shifting gear around the world very quickly um, to manage um, our data center buildups. For us, performance is very important. So uh, one of the key factors is that we want, for performance reasons, as many as OpenStack services as possible in one network so that we don't have to go over multiple hops and lose bandwidth in between. We also want to give our internal customers or our business units a large set of services they can use. So. We are not limiting ourselves to um, just the classical compute and storage, but we also want to use advanced network services like load balancing. We want to offer um, secret store and DNS as well. And also we have a lot of services on top that we offer, which we build ourselves, like um, our own dashboard and our billing services built on our HANA database. Um, and also we are currently working on a Kubernetes as a service so that we can give cont uh, containers to our customers as well. A little bit to our scale. So in absolute numbers, we are ranging roughly under 100,000 cores. We are currently around 1.1 um, petabytes of memory. And we have around 40,000 running instances and a relatively high turnaround. So we are counting around 4,000 instance operations a day, meaning create an instance, do something on it, delete it, redo it again. We have a lot of customers using automated tests, so our turnaround in general is very high. As you can see from the numbers, we are expecting basically a full cycle of all running instances every 10 days. We also have a relatively big net growth, so a couple hundred instances a day remain after all those operations, actually long running. We have two main things which might differentiate us a little bit from what everybody else is doing with OpenStack, and I will shortly try to give you an introduction what it is and why we are doing it. So first of all, our 10,000 foot view would be we have a control infrastructure underneath where we run our CoreOS and Kubernetes, which is fairly common nowadays. We have been doing it for quite a while now. On top of that, we run our control plane infrastructure, so the OpenStack itself, our analytics services, our monitoring, and everything else. But our customer payload, we see as a completely different entity. So we don't mix our control infrastructure and the infrastructure where customer payload actually is running on. So we are investing a lot of work into splitting those up properly. Um, the one thing, we do need a scale, and we had bad experience and, uh, with trying to um, run um, our network in a way that we use overlay from end to end, from device to device. So we decided to approach it differently because we need to integrate a lot of services into those networks for performance reasons. So we use something which is called um, hierarchical port binding in Neutron. And those are the particulars, but in the high level um, view would be we use overlay only within the network. And as soon as the packet leaves any switch, there is no more trace of an overlay network. So this is a functionality which Neutron gives us where we can run at different parts of our fabric, different protocols. So VMs, only CVLANs, 
Storage boxes only see VLANs. Network device only sees a VLAN, except for the core fabric. It sees VXLAN packets, and it gets encapsulated and de-encapsulated at the network edge level. So this um, gives us the opportunity with very um, little overhead on the attached devices to um, achieve a relatively large scale. This is one part where we look a little different, and it's also one part which took us a little time to get implemented because it's not the most um, well-publicized feature. And the second thing is, as I already said, we have a strict split between the control plane, where OpenStack actually runs, and the data plane. And we are concentrating our efforts mostly on maintaining a lot of low-level drivers where we can use OpenStack's orchestration to remote control already installed equipment in a data center or equipment which we have been comfortable with running at scale for a long time already. So imagine a large enterprise which has been um, using vCenters for their virtualization for 10 years. It's a huge benefit if you don't introduce a second hypervisor, another operating system where it runs on, and a new orchestration layer at the same time, but you can leverage your existing operations infrastructure to basically um, orchestrate it in a, in a more seam, uh, seamless way for the user. So as you can see, we are running our um, L3 through hardware routers. We are running our L2 through, um, through um, a Cisco ACI fabric. We are using um, established hardware load balancers. We are using um, vCenters and DSX servers as our virtualization platform. Um, and we use Cinder and Manila to drive our various storage backends. And so basically, if you imagine that we can, this allows us to treat the, the SLAs and SLOs for our two parts of the cloud completely differently. So we can define that we don't need to care about the Kubernetes run OpenStack side that much if we can ensure that the customer traffic survives an outage in any of the OpenStack controls. So if, a, if the dashboard goes down for 10 minutes, it's less of an issue than if an external facing application suffers a 10 minute outage. And to give you a little more insight on how the left hand box works, I'm handing over to Andrew. Sorry, hi. So um, yeah, I'm gonna focus in the top right hand corner. Um, on how we actually deploy the, um, the OpenStack and our own components on, um, on Kubernetes and, and how we get it running. So there's a slide that, if anyone's been to any presentation on OpenStack, this is probably already well known, uh, but we're using Helm to deploy, and uh, Helm is a, a package manager effectively for Kubernetes, and the package in this case is called a chart, and uh, it's providing tooling for install, update, delete, and it allows us to compose a OpenStack deployment based on a series of dependencies. So a release in, op in uh, Helm is a, a, a version deployment of a particular chart, and in our case, that, our case that reflects as an OpenStack region. And we can go uh, with Kubernetes and our sort of split control data plane from a empty Kubernetes infrastructure to uh, a running productive environment in about five minutes. And we can do pretty much zero downtime, sub minute, possibly sub 30 second uh, updates. So what we've uh, created is a, a set of charts that allow us to um, deliver a group of regions um, which are pretty much identical um, in the top right hand corner again here. Is it? Um, and what, all we really want to differ in those regions are the things that make that region unique. So it would be things like endpoints, the definition of the hardware, passwords, the rest of it, the functionality is identical across the regions. So what we do is we create a region chart which just has a dependency to a meta chart, this OpenStack Helm, and the region values that we push into Helm that generates the configuration at this level are just passwords, endpoints, domain names, hardware configuration. Um, and we rely on the next level down, the, the OpenStack Helm uh, chart, to allow us to deliver um, a predefined set of, unique, uh, of uh, constant function uh, OpenStack uh, deployment. Below that, we then have the individual components. So we have 
Nova, Neutron, Cinder, Glance, whatever we're putting in there. And each one of those then has a set of default values that tell it how it's going to behave. So really, the, the behavior is fixed through the chart structure. And then below that, we have uh, infrastructure components like Postgres, RabbitMQ, et cetera. And a typical chart would look like this. This is Nova, so we have deployments in Kubernetes for all of the processes that we need to run. We have a, an ingress and service for all of the services we need to expose either internally within the cluster or externally through the API or as an API. And the things that are slightly different from uh, some of the other um, sort of uh, OpenStack deployments that we've seen are the, the way we're handling the, the DB migration and also the way we're using operators in Kubernetes to uh, scale our hardware. So in terms of the DB migration, we, um, we have a job that runs and um, that runs the migration and in uh, Kubernetes, that will stay there until we delete it. If we need to upgrade the database, we delete the job, run a deploy again, and it will, um, it will deploy the, the DB. And for the uh, compute nodes and any hardware scaling that we're doing, we have an operator which is basically responsible for listening for external events and creating uh, the necessary uh, Kubernetes constructs that allow us to provide hypervisors. And all of the configuration and all of the uh, the values that we previously showed are being mapped in as uh, config maps and then mounted into the, um, the containers as, uh, as volumes and then transformed into, uh, into uh, OpenStack configuration. And what we do is we have this big chart um, that we just throw out to Kubernetes and it deploys everything. Um, and what we found initially was that that led to uh, timing problems with um, things like databases not being available or RabbitMQ not being available. And luckily, um, we were quite early to the game, and I think we were also uh, joined by Stackinatus, and they solved this problem with this Kubernetes entry point um, binary, which basically provides very basic dependency management. So what we do is we throw everything out, and we define within the specs the, um, the dependencies that we need to keep or ensure that the system is eventually running. So we start off with the databases and the uh, ingress and services being, being uh, running, and then we wait for the migration job to start. So that's got a dependency on the database, obviously. Once that's completed, the API starts up. It's dependent on the migration. And, um, and then once that's available, the, the headless services, the conductors, schedulers, et cetera, the compute nodes, can start, to, uh, can start to go in there. And, it's the, um, and then the operator takes care of, of scaling up the hypervisors once we've, um, once we've done that. And how that, um, that works, we have a, a thing we're calling a vCenter operator. It doesn't follow the, the core OS pattern exactly um, in terms of the, um, the way it's, it's sort of defined to work in the, in the documentation, but it, it basically provides us with operator type uh, behavior. So we, we deploy that into the, into the cluster and it's listening um, or polling a DNS, um, our DNS service. And as our infrastructure guys build out a new vCenter, the last thing they would do would be to create the DNS entry for, that, for the API on, endpoint. Once that, once that happens, the operator takes over and finds that it's got something new to configure and it takes some pre-configured uh, configuration for things like the username and master password so that it can generate the necessary configuration for the compute node. And then it will create from a template the necessary um, uh, compute and uh, uh, compute pods and also the config map to, uh, to get that working. So what we can do is we can say, create a vCenter, put it into the environment, and it's immediately recognized and configured and up and running. Um, and we're using that also for seeding keystone, so things like uh, service users, passwords, uh, endpoints, et cetera, they're all, uh, they're all being managed and, and populated via a, a, uh, an operator. And we see this, we're not doing it at the moment, but we see this as, other ways to, uh, as a way to scale the other components in the, in the data plane, so new load balancers, new routers, et cetera, would be self-discovered by an operator and configured, um, or the necessary agents would be configured to bring them online. And uh, this is a, a very small, but 
black screen which shows the, the result of the, of, the, of the Helm install. So at the, end of, at the end of that five minutes, this is what we're left with. It's basically all of the components we've got running in the, um, in the system. And hopefully there's a demo at the end which will put this into a bit more, bit more light. So what have we, um, what have we learned during our two years? Um, I think the first thing is that generally OpenStack works pretty well on Kubernetes. I think that seems to be well recognized um, in the last two summits. Um, the main problems we've seen are headless services are very difficult to health check. So things like conductors, schedulers, it's very difficult to tell whether they're actually doing what they're supposed to do. And we've also had problems with um, signal handling and orchestration. So um, the orchestration that we've solved with the Kubernetes entry point, and we're using dumb in it. Uh, as, a, as a basic process manager that will handle signal mapping. Um, there's a lot of cases where some of the OpenStack components don't react to the, uh, the signals that Kubernetes is using to uh, manage the pod lifecycle. The other problem we've had is that some of the, some of the components don't, um, they don't behave very well if you just throw them in and, and they're not ready for the environment that they're, or the environment's not what they're expecting. So for example, a conductor process tries to start if the database isn't there, it just waits. It doesn't retry, it just waits. It looks like it's running, but it's not. And there's no way for us to find out whether it's really working or not. So there's a few gotchas, I guess, in the, um, in the individual components that you have to work around. Um, and I, w luckily, the, the orchestration that we're using is doing that. The other thing that we found is that the, the big monolithic Helm chart that we've created doesn't really scale very well. Um, not in terms of technical scale, but in terms of the way people are, um, are interacting with it. So we started with one or two people building it, and we've now got a team of maybe 10 people interacting with the Helm chart. And the question of, is it safe to deploy, is asked probably daily. And so what we'd recommend, I think, is looking at, and what we're gonna try and do, uh, is to try and break that out into individual components. The reason we didn't do it in the first place was that when we started, Helm didn't really help us to do that, and, but there's been a lot of development, a lot of features in the last few months that will hopefully solve that problem for us. Um, so we're looking to split that up. The other thing is the, um, is the uh, monitoring. From our previous life, we created a, an open clone, um, or it was actually developed in parallel, and one of the things we didn't do at, right at the beginning was integrate monitoring. We put it in at the end, and it was not, not great. So the thing we've, We've, we're accepting is that um, things are going to break. There's a lot of moving parts, and it's very complicated to understand what's going on. Um, and with the nature of Kubernetes is those processes are going to stop. They're going to move around. They're going to um, they're going to start up in a way you didn't expect. So we've um, we're trying to use a lot of the the sort of core capabilities of of the Kubernetes ecosystem, um, particularly Prometheus, to uh, to scrape out a lot of metrics. And we've integrated a lot of middleware into, um, or some middleware into uh, OpenStack that will allow us to export via StatsD as many metrics as we can find within the OpenStack components. And we've also got some similar middleware that's doing the exception reporting for us. So we're not, we're not log parsing, we're actually capturing the exceptions as they occur, which has helped us significantly, I think, in terms of uh, problem solving. Um, we're also using a lot of canary tests so that when we make a deployment into a region, we've got both data plane and control plane checks, which very quickly alert us in our Slack channels whether or not something's gone wrong. So we're, um, yeah, we're, very, um, we're very keen on monitoring as much as we can. The, uh, in terms of OpenStack, there's, um, where it, when Martin said we're an internal cloud, we're trying to be an internal public cloud. So we're trying to make it as easy for our consumers to consume the cloud as possible. So we give them a self-service portal, a little bit like any public cloud dashboard. And we're controlling things through things like quotas, um, access control, and we're setting up administrative domains in, um, in Keystone. And we're, we're then restricting what people can do through policies. Now, all of those, at least from our perspective, are very niche features in, in OpenStack because every time we've tried to change them, it's taken a lot of effort to make them work. And um, 
those things for us are really, really important in terms of being able to restrict what people do or allow people to do things and to control how much people can use. Um, the other thing is, and it's related to that, is that we, we believe that OpenStack needs a proper UI for end users. Horizon, we couldn't really give it out to our end users. They wouldn't, they wouldn't use it, and it doesn't support most of the features we need to control it. So things like quotas, policies, domain support, they're all very sketchy, I think, within, um, within Horizon. And there's no self-service for, pe for getting people on board and for allowing people to access requests and for letting administrators process those requests. So we've built a dashboard, um, which we call Electra, which um, provides pretty much all the features that Horizon has, but then all of the things we need to allow our users to use the system. And uh, what we'll do now, hopefully, if, if we've got time, I think we have, we've got a, a very short demo which um, really talks about that or shows the, the effect of the control plane, data plane split. Um, so hopefully this will work. Um, not sure how I make it play. There we go. So it's gonna demo a very simple scenario of, uh, of taking down some elements of our control plane. So this is our dashboard here. And we've got a couple of VMs which are running a very um, simple web application, which we'll show shortly. And um, we've then got a load balancer, which is basically load balancing between those two servers. And um, this is our website, which is very close to Michael and my heart. Um, and as you can see, it's working. Everything's running. And if we look at our dashboard here, everything's green and, and rosy. So what we'll do. Now is I'll set up a ping to the two, well, to one of the VMs and one of the, and to the load balancer endpoint. Sequences have been shortened, so you might notice some skips in the sequence numbers. And this is our, um, our control plane um, that we showed earlier. And what I'm gonna do now is delete Neutron, so, or delete all the Neutron components um, from, from our control plane. And, And because of this control plane split now, everything's still running through the hardware. You can see the monitors are, are, starting, to, um, are starting to go red. And if we look on the control plane now, we'll see hopefully all traces of Neutron have been expunged. And uh, if we now go back to the um, look at the monitors, I think the API is going to go down shortly. And... Uh, it's unfortunately showing the one thing that we're keeping in our data plane, or in our control plane, which is the metadata service. We have some plans there, but we haven't implemented them yet. And the API and the LBAT API have gone down for Neutron now. But our valuable mustache website is still um, hopefully working. And as you can see, the ping lives throughout the, the, the downtime. And then what I'll do now is just do a Helm upgrade, which will now make it so again, so that predefined release is now going to be applied, and hopefully Neutron will come back, um, will come back up. So that's the Helm deployment finished. Um, it gives a nice report of what's happened. And if we now look back on the, um, on the pods, we'll see that Neutron's hopefully back and running for us, so we're back into a, a healthy state. And if we now go back to the, um, to the alerting screen, we should hopefully see that those alerts are gonna recover. Um, And hopefully that's it. So that's how we're, um, I guess, managing a very, or relatively complex uh, OpenStack deployment across multiple regions, and how um, how Helm is helping us to do that with Kubernetes. And uh, oops, sorry. Now I hand over to Michael. He'll tell us what's happening next. Oh. Tech. 
All right, so I, I want to talk about what's next for us with Converge Cloud. Andrew, as you heard, talked mostly about we, how we are leveraging Kubernetes to help us operate our OpenStack. And now that we have OpenStack running, we're actually thinking about how we could use OpenStack to make our Kubernetes better. But first, I want to take a small step back and tell you how we're actually installing those Kubernetes control planes. Um, when we start out, we get completely bare data centers, and there's nothing in it. We don't have any infrastructure, nothing. And so we started to build out our own little machinery to actually install those clusters on bare metal machines. And I went to the talk yesterday about the Kubernetes club sandwich, and the speaker was actually asking, why would you want to install Kubernetes on top of OpenStack if you could just as well put it on bare metal? You should be in a happy land, right? But my answer to that question is it's not really a happy land. Uh, Kubernetes on bare metal is just as hard, if not harder. For starters, uh, we need to build that infrastructure. It might be easy if you install Kubernetes on your Raspberry Pi and you just type in the commands. But if you're looking at building up 15 regions and each region consists of 10 or 11 hosts, you're in a bit of a trouble. So we started to create that infrastructure, and you get to the point where you're thinking, am I building Ironic, or should I maybe spend my money on some product and buy this thing? So it's a bit sketchy there. And we also figured out that we're really missing the undercloud in Kubernetes. There's no load balancing, which is native to bare metal, and we have to figure out a workaround to actually expose our services. And there is something, but it's a bit of a stepchild. They are using these external IPs. We don't have any volume management natively. We also have to go back to our vendors and ask them to have um, some kind of intermediate component which brings us volume management into Kubernetes, or we have to do it manually, as we do at the moment. And also, the whole networking part in Kubernetes on bare metal is an interesting puzzle which is left for the interested admin to figure out. Or you have to go down to the marketplace and talk to the vendors what they have to sell you. So we actually implemented something called, we call the Cube Parrot. It's a BGP speaker, which is Kubernetes aware. And so it talks to Kubernetes, and it talks to the underlying infrastructure, and it tells the whole system, or the, the networking components, how the Kubernetes networking is supposed to look like. But you have to do that your own, on your own. And finally, Kubernetes is not, or how do I say that? It's not really supporting the bare metal use case that well. Google themselves, they are running on GCE, and that's their main use case, what they are driving. And we often run into edge cases where we are thinking like, how is this even working? Is anyone else using this? And that's just, the reality we are seeing with this whole bare metal thing. So how do we get out of that trouble? The first step we are taking is we are starting to manage our Kubernetes clusters to, with Kubernetes. Uh, so this picture actually looks like a no-brainer. Why are you, not, are you not doing that in the first place? And when we started, we experimented with uh, self-aware Kubernetes clusters, which could manage themselves. But all of that stuff is getting quite complicated. So we are now finally came to the conclusion that we are just managing Kubernetes with Kubernetes instead of building up our bare metal IPXC ironic clone further. That also allows us to use a unified tooling. So we're also going to use Helm to actually install Kubernetes itself and all the auxiliary systems that we have around it, like the Prometheus servers, which manage this whole stack, and some extra components that uh, help with operating the, the OpenStack cluster. But ultimately, we're still missing the undercloud. The interesting thing, though, is that now that we have that whole machinery and we actually have a running OpenStack, we came to the idea, what if we take all of this and we stick it on top of OpenStack, then we're going to end up with something like this. Instead of bare metal, we have the same cluster on OpenStack. 
and we try to reuse as much as we can from our bare metal infrastructure. We can reduce all the, the hacks and the bare metal edge cases that don't really work, and we can recycle our own procedures and stuff and actually give this thing to our customers. So we are thinking about, or we are actually implementing um, a Kubernetes as a service based on this concept, and we are reusing the same principles and mechanisms and tooling and software and everything which we have uh, for building up the Kubernetes clusters in the first place. And what's really cool about it is that what Andrew showed you with the control plane split is also now happening for our customers. So if they set up a load balancer in Kubernetes, it actually ends up configuring an F5 load balancer through Elbas, and it gives you the same control plane split as we are leveraging for OpenStack itself. The, we also have Cinder volumes then. There is native support in, in the OpenStack cloud provider for Kubernetes. We get auto-provisioned volumes right from Cinder. We have uh, native neutron networking also in the cloud provider. What we intend to use is a flat network where Kubernetes just talks to uh, neutron directly and sets up uh, static routes for the pods. From here, we then thought, what can we actually provide to our customers to really supercharge those clusters? Now that we have OpenStack, maybe we can do some cool features which no one else can do. And I'm going to show you like two examples that we are implementing at the moment. And one of them is an OpenStack native Ingress controller. To give you a bit of context, Ingress, the word uh, fell a few times already, it's an L7 reverse proxy in Kubernetes and it allows uh, the users to easily define an ingress point for their services. Like if you look at the bottom left, that's an uh, ingress spec, and as you can see, there's a host name in there and a service name, and what's, happen what's happening in the background is that Kubernetes will pick up whatever ingress controller you have deployed and make that spec a reality. There is um, the most common ingress implementation is based on Nginx, so what's actually happening is that when you deploy that, you get a bunch of Nginx servers which listen to the Kubernetes API and reconfigure themselves depending on the users put into. For uh, GCE, there's a native implementation where the ingress controller actually talks to the, to, the, to the undercloud and sets up the load balancers. And since like a week or two ago, there's also an ingress implementation for AWS, uh, which our colleagues from Cora has provided. And our intention is to actually implement this ingress controller for OpenStack and so that we can all use it. And what would ultima ultimately happen is that the spec on the left will be translated to, will be configuring a native hardware F5 load balancer, which gives you like hardware TLS termination and enterprise grade load balancing. We're gonna connect it to designate, so all the DNS names are already automatically being set up, so you don't even have to worry about how the Keystone Cloud SAP C name gets onto the floating IP of that load balancer. And one big problem that we're seeing is the certificate management for all these applications. For our OpenStack, we actually have 30 certificates per regions, and give that times 15, that's a lot of certificates to manage, so you need to have some kind of automated process to renew those TLS certificates. That's something we have already, and we intend to just stick it into this controller as well so that our users get this whole nice workflow right out of the box and don't have to worry about it at all anymore. So that's one example. The second example how we can supercharge those clusters is um, about the GPU demand that we're seeing. Just like everyone else, I suppose, uh, we have this machine learning hype in SAP, and our business units are starting to request um, GPU resources from our cloud. Uh, the use case we're seeing most commonly is uh, TensorFlow on Kubernetes. So for us, that means we have the problem that we need to mix and match uh, VMs and GPU resources for our customers. And also here, OpenStack can help us to actually build this up quickly. We're just gonna use Nova and Ironic, and for our orchestration layer on top, it doesn't really make a difference whether it's a VM or whether it's a bare metal GPU box. So with those two examples, I'd like to conclude the presentation. 
And you can find all this magic sauce actually, actually on GitHub. Most of it is open source. And you can see, find it in the organization SAP CC for Converged Cloud. With that, thank you for your attention. And if there's any questions, we're happy to help you out. <laughs> Do you want to answer that, Andrew? Yeah, um, a lot of it isn't actually OpenStack code. I think uh, there's a lot of little bug fixes which um, we keep trying to get around to putting upstream, um, but it's a very hard, long process. Um, a lot of the stuff is just completely standalone, or it's things like the Helm charts, which are, are, are you know, there, there is an OpenStack Helm. Um, in OpenStack now, but there wasn't when we started, and it's it's uh, it's very similar, but not quite the same. And I think um, the actual changes that we've made or need to make to OpenStack, they're largely in vendor code, um, and we're working with ven the vendors for in our data plane to 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 sort of upstream some of the requirements and the edge cases we're finding. But there isn't actually that much that we're changing or need to change within OpenStack, apart from you know there's things like where Horizon we just we just found it was going to be just too hard to, to change, so we just wrote our own because it, it was going to be quicker. So I think it's not really, um, yeah, it's not really things we need to change upstream. I think there's a few things that we'd probably like to maybe discuss with people and, and you know, in the longer term, but it's not, it's not something that we need to do, I think, at the moment in terms. I, mean, I don't think it would add any value to upstream our UI, for example. It's there, and people can use it, and if, we want, if people want to collaborate with us, they, they can do. Um, until we get some traction. Probably you didn't cover this part. But were there any particular challenges with NFS as a service in your environment? Not really. Um, or, or not. I mean, it's, to be honest, it's not one of our heavily used services. So we're we're seeing that as we scale, there are issues coming uh, with some of the, um, you know, some of the edge cases that we're finding. But I think um, I'm not aware of any particularly, um, you know, where it's, it's basically plain Manila with, um, with a, a NetApp backend. And so far, um, it's, it's, it's working pretty well, I think. Is there anything we should be looking for? Or? <laughs> Just wondering, that's all. Um, because that was not necessarily mentioned in Manila. And yeah, no, I mean, I, there's, there's a whole load of, we, unfortunately, we probably don't have time to go through everything. I mean, there's a whole load of things we, we would have liked to have, have gone through. But yeah, I mean, we haven't really had any, apart from the things I mentioned from an OpenStack open perspective, we haven't really had any sort of major things that are, that are concerning. And a lot of that, I think, is, is because of the way we're pushing it into, into the sort of more traditional hardware space. So we're really just remote controlling the hardware. And there are issues, and there's things we're working with you know, some of the vendors with to solve, but they're not, um, I don't think most of them are unsolvable problems. Um, um, two more questions, right? So, um, did you settle on Ironic for Vanguard provisioning, or I didn't, I didn't get your conclusion on that part? Um, yeah. For the you yeah. Did. yeah. Okay. Um, other than that, so the recent OpenStack, and this one, there's a lot of developments around OEMs and uh, people, hardware acceleration for those things. If we had to redo this, would you have reconsidered any aspect of grid networking? For the networking part? Yeah. It's, I mean, there's always things you would change, but fundamentally, no. Actually, it's still from our last iteration where we had. Um, you need to come back. No. <laughs> where we basically had. We're in a situation that. Um, <clears throat> We had our own platform doing stuff like this in completely our own way, and we were modeling upstream APIs from Amazon to give to our customers. And there we already did a lot of um, orchestration of the backend, and we decided against 
some overarching SDN theme. We try to make it simple because in the networking part, when you make it complicated, it doesn't scale anymore and it's not operatable anymore. And so we try to make the orchestration, let's say, more complex, but keep the actual on-device configuration as simple as human poss humanly possible to keep it operatable. Otherwise, if you have basically, if you need to trace a packet through five different software switches and try to find where the thing gets lost, that's, um, you're doomed to failure or you're having a very hard time to operating that in the long term. So the general concept is still, I think, something we don't regret yet. I, I, think, I think the other thing is we're, we're a very small team. We're, I, mean, I don't know, maybe even with our extended team, less than 50. And I think leveraging our existing support for the hardware-based stuff is really helping us. We, we, it's a problem we can sort of not worry about. If, if that makes sense, so that we have colleagues in other areas of the, of the organization that can handle the support without necessarily needing to know the details of OpenStack or any, you know, any specific implementation. Thanks. All right, brilliant. Thank you, folks. Thanks. Thanks.